Hello and welcome to the Brightway System mini course. You're going to find tips and tricks that didn't make it into the book, but that I think are still very, very important. So let's get started. Step number one is purpose. And for me, purpose is so important because it fundamentally reminds you why you do what you do. When you know your purpose, it gives you an incredible amount of energy. Why? Because it taps into something very, very deep inside you that has been with you from day one. Now, what are some of the side effects of this? Number one, it gives you an incredible amount of confidence. When you know your purpose, suddenly you are on a bigger mission in life and you are able to really tap into the deepest reasons why you do what you do. And because your purpose is always something that is powerful and quite lofty in intention, you know, it may be something like coming back to your true self. It may be connecting with others through your true self. It may be something, you know, very much along these quite elevated lines. You feel good about sharing that. You don't wonder, oh, is this a worthwhile message? Should I be saying this? You really are unequivocal about the value of what you're sharing when it comes from your purpose. So it gives you a huge amount of confidence. And I've especially seen this happen in the music world because we get on stage and that's a time when the spotlight is literally on you and you wonder, why am I here? And then you remember your purpose and you're like, oh yeah, I really want to share this purpose. Yes, I know. I will probably make some mistakes. I mean, pretty much guaranteed some mistakes will happen unless you're only playing three notes. You know, it's going to happen, but it doesn't feel like a big deal because your purpose is such a magnificent thing, a thing of great glory that you want to share. And it gives you faith in yourself, which is the true meaning of confidence, confides. This helps eliminate imposter syndrome. Now, imposter syndrome, I do mention it in the book, is where we feel we are illegitimate for saying certain things. We may feel like we're not an authority to say such things. We may also feel all our successes happened by accident or they were a fluke or somehow we're fooling people. All this stuff gets thrown to the side when we know about what our purpose is because that's the only place that we're really coming from. If we know what our purpose is, we don't feel like an imposter. We know what the purpose is. We know why we're sharing. We don't feel like we're fooling anybody. We feel like any success, which I'll get later in step five, uh, we don't feel like any success is not warranted, you know, because we feel like our purpose, yes, it's a magnificent and quite universal thing. And so we stand behind it and we feel good. So we get energy, we get confidence. And a third thing I'd like to talk about with you today is the purpose really helps you make decisions. So you can filter all the millions of things that come at us every day through purpose. Now, if you're like me, and I think you probably are, there are many things that interest you and there are many things you'd love to pursue. There are many things you could be good at, great at, excellent at. The one limitation I will admit in life is there appear to be 24 hours in a day on our plane. I know there are other dimensions, but right now we are on a physical plane and I know there are 24 hours and I'm willing to admit that. So we do have to filter out decisions. You know, what are we going to do and what are we not going to do? And I'll get to that in just a minute with step two. But by knowing your purpose, it really helps you choose what is in alignment with my purpose and what isn't. If something is not in alignment with your purpose, you really can put it aside. Let someone else pursue that intention. I think there's more than enough space in the world for everyone to take on the intentions that really speak strongly to them. Don't worry that something won't be pursued. It will be pursued, but it will only have value if you pursue something that has your purpose behind it. So for all these reasons, 
purpose is what we start with in the bright way system because it's really the foundation of all your confidence of all your direction and also of all your energy when you tap into your purpose you get an insane amount of energy just popping out when I have to do some of the more kind of sloggy things, uh, you know, answer emails, um, do a certain type of practice to master a technique that is tricky, um, <clears throat> what do I do? I literally just tap into my purpose. I say, okay, remember why you're doing this. I'm like, oh yeah, that's my real purpose. That's my real reason for doing things. And then writing that email, doing that practice becomes part of your purpose and it's less burdensome. Finally, I'd really like to add this part uh, regarding purpose. Your purpose is a real reflection of your essence, what is inside you. Now, however you decide to manifest your purpose is a different thing how you, maybe you're a musician maybe you're a writer maybe you're a chef maybe you're raising your children these actions are how you manifest your purpose but these actions are not you so i've found that particularly with musicians uh, we tend to over identify with how we practice our purpose we are a musician we become identified solely as a musician, meaning that when things don't go well in our musical life, we feel really bad about ourselves on a soul level. We feel that we're not worthy. And that's a terrible thing. So when you know your purpose, clearly as just one statement of the essence that's inside you, then how you take action on that becomes something different and you know it's something different. You don't get hooked up or over identified with those actions, which we'll talk about in just a minute in step two. So purpose gives you the biggest freedom you can imagine because you're free to be truthfully yourself and own yourself, not your actions, not the results of your actions. It's yourself. When it comes to step two, which is set your intentions, I love intentions, as you know, because I find that goals are very end oriented. The whole thing about living is to live. We live minute by minute. We only have the present. The past is gone. The future is not there. And both of those are only a result of being present anyway. So there really is only a series of presences. When you set intentions rather than a goal, which is something you move towards, when you set an intention, every minute that you are living that intention, you are living your life and you are living the creative journey. By living an intention rather than a goal, you stay present and available for everything that's happening to you at that moment. All the learning that's available, all the joy that's available, all the feedback that's available. So your inspiration and your progress accelerate as a result. When you focus on having a process rather than a product, you actually end up with a better product in the end. I don't know if you've had this experience of being really obsessed with an end goal. It must look like this. It can only look like this. And so we move towards that goal without noticing all these other options that opened up to us on the side, options for other types of learning, other types of input, other types of inspiration. We did not see them. We did not take the cues because we were just hell bent on that particular goal. And so we lost out on a lot. Therefore, ending up with an inferior product. So by setting intentions, you really stay in process, in the present. And because of that, in addition, you maintain your energy. When we throw our attention to something in the future, which is basically an illusion, we're throwing our energy at something that actually does not exist. 
The only thing that's existing is right now. And so as we set our intention and we're deeply in that intention, living with full presence, with all our attention to our intention, so much energy is generated, so much extra inspiration is generated. And as a result, you also are able to take in information at a much greater rate. In other words, your progress looks better. You learn more deeply. You're more available to accelerate. Not that accelerating is the only intention that we have, but you know, as humans, I have to admit, we want to feel progress in what we do. We do not feel happy if we feel stagnant. And I feel this is a truth because of nature. When something in nature starts to stand still and not grow, it does stagnate. And that's just not where we're at right now. We want to feel alive. We want to feel like we're moving ahead on our journey. So as you set intentions rather than goals, keep in mind that this idea of presence, this idea that you're on a continuous journey, step by step, that you're on a process, not a product, will actually give you much better results in the end both in terms of your inspiration and in terms of your long-term energy and motivation. For step three, which is all about creating your practicum plan, I go into great detail in the book about how to do this, and I actually have attached for you a little template that you can use for your practice plan. Now you may find that this practice plan template is exhaustive and you don't want to fill out every single part of it. Absolutely fine. I see it as a very diagnostic tool. So it's basically just showing you where are you at, stoking your imagination as to where can I leverage more learning, where do I perhaps have some holes in my practice? So take a look at that, number one. And then number two, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about some other examples of practice plans. So as people write out practice plans, you know, they can use journals. I've seen spreadsheets. You can use voice memo as well. So for instance, if you um, have issues writing or if you are on the go all the time, you may have your practice journal on voice memo instead. And they have wonderful voice memos now where you can actually name them so you actually can find the file. It's not got uh, some crazy numbers only on it find a method that really works for you. You may find that having a stack of post-its is great and you're writing your notes basically on the fly and then you transfer them into a more um, organized type of practice plan. You may find that even videotaping what you do and then going back and reviewing it is your practice plan. You know, there are so many different ways of doing things. And my recommendation to you is find out what others are doing and what works for you. So whatever other people are doing is not the only way. There are many other methods as well. And so I presented some of them to you and I'd like to mention one more that has had a lot of success in my Bright Knowledge Harp Circle, where we practice the bright way to great intensity. And that has been using the bullet journal method. Now, it's not the official word that I have in the Bright Knowledge System or the Bright Way System to use the bullet journal, uh, because I don't believe one way is ever the answer for anything. However, I have found, and for myself personally, the bullet journal method is really pretty cool. So if you have a chance to look that up, do. There's a great YouTube channel that the bullet journal people have made, and you can watch those tutorials and see, you know, is this something that would work for me? Why it's worked so well for me is it is incredibly flexible and it keeps everything in one place. I have found that over time, life, becomes one. It used to be in the past, for instance, with websites that you would have your musician website, your teaching website, your personal website, because we didn't want to confuse people by having all these different 
hats on. The thinking nowadays is like, those are all you. You're one person, you're one entity with all these facets. Put them in one place. So I actually congealed my website to one thing. So in the same way, having your schedule and then your creative work and then your personal life all in different silos, I find just doesn't work anymore. And my feeling is life will become more and more integrated as we go on in our society now and having separate files essentially separate journals of what we're doing is just not working i find it very very confusing and that we're not able to leverage cross training so you may have heard the phrase as you do one thing so you do everything and you if you keep everything together will notice parallels between your personal life your work life your creative life and realize oh my goodness it's really all the same thing i have the same purpose behind everything or if i don't you know what can i do for instance with my work to make it more integrated with my pur purpose so that i feel more fulfilled uh, if i have in my personal life i'm raising my children i'm not feeling fulfillment can i find a way to engage more from my purpose so that i do feel that fulfillment and therefore my children for example will also feel more joy more inspiration more hope more possibility so for all these reasons i recommend at this moment trying out the bullet journal for your practice plan and see how does this work for you when it comes to step number four which is integration the most important thing is to maintain discernment not judgment so judgment is when we hear words like good, bad, I'm good at this, I'm bad at this, or I did this, it was good, I was did this, it was bad. These are blanket terms that have actually very little insight and value. Number one, if we say something's bad, we feel bad. And that is so demotivating. And once we get demotivated, this is kind of the end of the story, right? So we don't want that to happen. If we say something's good, we feel that we have to live up to that for the next time. So that can put a pressure on us. Instead, when we use discernment, we say, is this working or is this not working? And that's all. So if it's working, we're like, yeah, it's working. I'm glad it's working. Why is it working? So we even go deeper into it. So rather than, oh, something's good, end of story, we say it's working and why? When you know why, then you can start amplifying what it is that is working and therefore you get a lot more results you get more inspiration progress happens when we say the other side of the coin with discernment it's not working we also say ah why we still can be active rather than oh that was bad and let me just count the ways that that was bad that stops us cold in our tracks instead we say okay it's not working I wonder why. And in our system, we apply the five essential elements of artistry, learning, technique, community, and inspiration. Because when something's not working, we often do get frustrated and it's hard to know, okay, where do I start in finding out why it's not working? The five essential elements are these pre-made tools that you can use immediately to jumpstart your inquiry as to why the thing is not working. And if those don't work, and I detail how they can work in the book, if they don't work, then reaching out for help is key. Community is a huge part of the Bright Way system. And honestly, it's a huge part of how humans evolved. I saw a very interesting documentary where they were talking about Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And uh, actually, I got my DNA results. It turns out I'm slightly less than 4% Neanderthal. So I was very happy to hear that Neanderthals appear to have comparable intelligence to Homo sapiens. However, they had tiny communities. Homo sapiens were living in groups of about 150 people, generally, where Homo sapiens, uh, sorry, Neanderthals, very, very tiny groups, um, less than 13 often. And they showed how tools evolved over time in the two communities and that with Neanderthals, the same tool kind of stayed the same, 
for literally millennia. Whereas with Homo sapiens, the evolution of their tools was rapid fire. And they said in the documentary that it was because they had bigger communities. They were getting more feedback about the tool. More people were using the tool. As soon as an evolution happened with the tool, everybody saw it and started implementing it. And so this proves to me how it is collaboration, not competition that drives progress forward. So for all of these reasons, um, using discernment along with community is key for your integration. Finally, we get to step five, which is fulfillment. And I have to say, even though this is the most fun step in most ways, as I say in the book, it is also the most avoided practice. People will tend to gloss over this step to a large degree. And it's so unfortunate because it's absolutely critical to everything you do on your creative path. You must practice fulfillment. Fulfillment is what gives you confidence. It makes you know that you own the thing that you did. It makes you believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself and you believe that all your accomplishments are either a fluke, uh, fooling other people, uh, or that they didn't happen, really, it's very hard to have motivation. It's very hard to feel like going on with your creative life. So I really urge you to practice fulfillment. I urge you in the book as well, but I'm going to urge you again here because the follow through on step five is probably the lowest of all the steps, even though you think it'd be the highest. You think that, ah, oh, people would love practicing fulfillment. This is going to be like a, almost like a bonus step. But in reality, what I found over working this system with hundreds of people is, if not thousands, is that they overlook fulfillment. And I'll tell you, never once have I seen, not even once have I seen anybody be unhappy with taking this step. And also in terms of what people report back to me, 100% of the time they have said that they have found many more things in their fulfillment list than they thought were there initially. They started writing their list and then more and more things came to them. There were many things they forgot. And this is also part of human nature. You know, we're problem solvers. So once something works well, we tend to be like, okay, great, move on to the next thing. And that's great, but it downplays the successes. And when we downplay our successes, we kind of forget them. And then we don't have either the well of joy, the inspiration that we need going forward, and we don't have the resilience that we need going forward. So no matter what in life, there are going to be things that happen, probably even this week, that are frustrating and upsetting. And we need resilience to deal with them. Resilience gives us the ability to bounce back. And I talk about resilience a lot in my circle because honestly, the fact is in human life, we're in this great university and we are going to get things coming at us. And it would be remiss of me to say, hey, just go out there, have a great time and basically throw people to the lions when the fact is that life does have difficult moments and it has difficult moments on a weekly, if not daily basis. Is that really horrible news? No because we can cultivate our resilience. How do we cultivate resilience? Through fulfillment. So fulfillment, as you saw in the book is, or will see in the book if you haven't read it yet, is when you sit and actively remember everything that you are proud of having accomplished over a certain period of time. It could be if you practice fulfillment um, regularly, it would be over a fairly short period of time, but if it's your first time practicing fulfillment, it may be things from a very long time ago, everything is fair game. And you fill up with great joy about these things and you own them. You own them honestly. Uh, I am going to mention something I do mention in the book. I'm going to repeat it because it's another sticking point people have. 
uh, people fear they're going to become arrogant by practicing this. It's really quite the opposite. Once you practice fulfillment and you really believe in what you have done, you're more likely to celebrate other people's successes. You feel good about yourself and you see someone else succeed, you feel good for them. You don't feel as envious and you don't feel as threatened by them. When we feel down about ourselves and we see someone else doing very well, we feel even more down about ourselves and we may feel resentful towards that other person, even though actually their success is taking nothing away from us. And we know that intellectually, but emotionally we are at such a low ebb that we feel rubbishy. We can counteract this and we can, by practicing fulfillment, become really pleased with what we've achieved and really able to celebrate other people's successes as well. So quite the opposite of arrogance. So I urge you to practice fulfillment. And I want to give you one other tip. Although fulfillment is step five in the Brightway system, the fact is I'd like you to practice it regularly at any point in your life. I'd like you to practice it on a daily basis. Really celebrate what it is that you feel proud of having accomplished. It's going to give you more inspiration, more joy, more motivation. It's going to give you resilience and it's going to make all your relationships with everybody else and also with the planet itself so much more sustainable, so much more fulfilling, and you're going to be a bright light in this world. So go forward and shine your light. I want to see that. I believe in you. I want a world where people feel that they are this bright energy because that's that's what they are. I mean, they are that inside and I know that for sure. I just know that people can't really see that inside themselves sometimes. So my ultimate aim for the whole book and the whole system is that you encounter your brightness inside yourself and that we all walk the bright way together. Thank you for being on this journey with me. Bye.